A local parlance says every day might be for the thief, but one day it's for the owner. This could readily be applicable to the recent onslaught of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, against drug traffickers who seem bent on making quick money through illicit means. From available records, no week passes without a raid or arrest of offenders who are scattered across the country with operations far and beyond. The recent raid by the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency suggests the agency is not resting on its oars as it has set out to raid the country of the menace of drug abuse and trafficking. In fact, available data suggests that 30 to 35 million people spend about $15,000 to $30,000 annually on psychotropic drugs and beverages. A phenomenon health watchers believe is a public health concern in Nigeria. The issue of drug abuse consistently headlines discuss due to its prevalence with a number of cases, especially among adolescents and teenagers. The past few weeks has been a busy one for the NDLEA, who are relentless in sustaining the fight against drug abuse and trafficking. Although analysts and observers say it appears the renewed efforts and collaboration with relevant agencies and other countries in fighting drug abuse and trafficking could be the magic wand. They are, however, quick to draw attention to the level of crime, violence and insecurity these causes. But tough as the operations have been in storming the tide, more culprits are still falling into their hands with little or no regard for the long arm of the law. Why is this so? And what has been the strategy of the authorities in sustaining the fight against drugs and trafficking? Also, what level of cooperation does Nigeria need to strengthen action in achieving a drug-free society. This is Nigeria today. I am your carrier, Clinton. Welcome to the program. Joining me to discuss uh, sustaining the fight against drug abuse and trafficking is Femi Baba Femi, Director of Media and Advocacy, National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Thank Welcome you. to the program. Thank you. Good evening. It's good to have you here. My pleasure. Also joining us is uh, Chuks Akamadu, a legal practitioner and president, Center for Ethical Rebirth among Nigerian youth, Serrani. Glad to have you join us once again. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I'll start with you, uh, Femi. You know, uh, we've had uh, many arrests and seizures in the past months. What has been the trigger for the success stories? Well, I think um, there was um, a paradigm shift in the operational efficiency of the agency with the coming of um, Brigadier General Mohamed Buba Marwa as the chairmanship executive in January 2021. And uh, it was not just all about um, his person, it's about um, some of the strategies he came with first by motivating the officers and men he would be working with, doing a lot of things like um, giving them promotion, um, regularizing their ranks. That is um, was a very great one, quite a number of people had been stagnated for years on the same rank and uh, was able and quite a number of the allowances, especially for those, um, for families of, um, serve, I mean, officers who died in active service, who uh, were owed some benefits or allowances, you know, those things were things that could demoralize anybody because what you see, what happened to your departed colleague? You wouldn't want to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And so all, a lot of those things were done. And so they seemed to be like, oh, new people were brought into the agency to start doing the work when results started coming in. And again, there is one thing about um, the 
um, operational maximum of the agency, I mean, which he brought in in January 2021, which is offensive action. You go all out after the cartels, the barons. You know, the agency shifted focus uh, to really putting the heat on those that had over the years appeared untouchable or invisible. That is the bearers. You understand? And so the moment we started going after them, taking them out of circulation, you know, you have quite a lot of syndicates, cartels crumbling. And that was exactly um, what I just watched on your on on, on the station, what you just um, mm. read in the news now about um, you have three major syndicates in Lagos operating, transnational ones for that matter, and um, within a spate of days, they were all taken down by a special unit of the agency. So these were things, the results that were coming out of this kind of pragmatic leadership and a kind of leadership that is directly involved, not just uh, providing leadership from the comfort of your home, but then directly involved okay. in day-to-day -day activities of the agency. Th th thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Chooks. Uh, I know uh, we've had uh, quite a, a lot of, um, you know, uh, achievements by the NDLEA. However, one would ask, uh, what are the root causes of uh, the drug abuse in Nigeria, as well as uh, the trafficking? Well, for, uh, before I go into that, I would want to make an observation. In your introductory remark, you did say that uh, a report of what NDLA uh, does uh, is like a weekly thing that every week. Uh, well, I think differently. I think differently because um, from my records uh, in the recent times, especially uh, since the assumption of office of the current uh, chairman, uh, chief executive of NDLA, uh, we've had, uh, we've been having uh, rates arrests, prosecutions, and convictions on daily basis. It's no longer on weekly basis, which is quite alarming. It's not something that, uh, yes, it's something that uh, uh, one would say uh, requires us to uh, give NDLA a pat on the back, but um, looking at it from the other angle, you'll find that it's quite alarming. Uh, that we are in a society that is under siege by uh, uh, the twin evil of drug abuse and uh, illicit trafficking. Uh, coming straight to your uh, question, you see, um, uh, I'm glad that we're where we are at the moment because before the coming of the current leadership of the NDLA, it looked as though things were, things were okay. Uh, but suddenly, with the uh, coming of uh, Brigadier General Abuba Marwa, we've suddenly realized that, uh, come on, we have uh, a worsening emergency on our hands. This thing has eaten deep into the very fabric of our national life, and uh, it has become a potent threat that is capable of consuming all of us. So at least there is that consciousness that, oh, that if we don't kill this thing, this thing will kill us. And uh, quite a number of factors can be attributed to the root cause of um, drug abuse. Number one, le uh, let us not isolate Nigeria and make it look as though it's the worst of all. Oh, no, I know it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's global a global thing. phenomenon. It's a global uh, thing. God, God yes. bless you. Uh, so uh, we, we must have that clearly stated that it's not uh, restricted to uh, Nigeria. So, Globally, there's a downturn in, our, in, in humanities, morals, values, and all of that. Ours is actually a decadent society. But again, how each society, how each distinctive society decides to handle that decline in morals and values and all of that is what separates one society from another. And that's why we are glad that at the moment, the NDLA is now alive to its responsibilities, realizing that all of those excuses that are given uh, as reasons why people engage in uh, drug abuse should not be accommodated. When people say they are bored, 
And for that reason, they take to drug abuse. Young people say they are depressed. For that reason, they take to drug abuse. We have housewives who say that they are lonely. For that reason, they take to drug abuse. All of those are excuses and all of that. We appreciate that. And of course, there are people who actually look at the economic climate of the country and they say, oh, this economy is really dealing with us very harshly. These are reasons, quote and unquote, but I call them excuses. But the truth of the matter is that what you're resorting to hurts you. It hurts your family. It hurts your society. It hurts everywhere. It hurts everyone. So why do you go for that which is even more hurtful than your so-called loneliness, your so-called boredom, and your so-called economic hardship. So it's just like one inflicting greater damage on oneself by saying, oh, is this, this is why we do this, this is why we do this. But we, are, uh, we understand all of that, and of course, we insist that our government, when we say government, of course, we mean, we mean both those in the home of affairs and then the people, because the government cannot clap with one hand. Okay. We need a collaboration between the government and the people to see how we can overcome Th all of these socioeconomic we'll, and political we'll, we'll, we'll challenges. Definitely, we'll get to that point. Now, uh, Femi, your last arrest and uh, seizure seems unexpected. When you, you know, with the arrest of an alleged baroness and uh, four kingpin, can you tell us a little bit about that um, arrest, how it was affected? <laughs> okay, now, um... Like I said, the NDLA has, um, just like Shuk said, has really been well retooled and um, remolded in a way that to make it efficient, proactive, and pragmatic. And that's um, one of the results of that is what uh, we witnessed in Lagos um, uh, in the last week. And that's not just, uh, that is just one of such, like Shuk said. Unfortunately, I, 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 I didn't um, get your early remarks to actually know, I mean, to actually uh, provide, um, to shed, shed light on the fact that indeed we have hundreds and thousands of operations going on every day, but we just wait probably towards the end of the week or as the need um, um, arises to pick just a few and send out and share with the public just to educate and inform the we public. We work according to information. Okay, yeah. The information yeah. available to us. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. I understand that. Now, <laughs> coming to um, the, the operations in Lagos uh, last week, um, basically, we have a special unit. Um, we don't normally disclose the identity or the full names of that unit. Um, but then their responsibility is to handle these um, special cases, the, the, I mean, those of um, those involving the big cartels, the barons, and so um, they've been working on these people, and they were able to uh, follow track the particular woman um, to her base in Festac area of Lagos, uh, monitored her until she was able to leave her house, go to a warehouse restock and she was about um, she was preparing actually preparing to send those things to the southeast the tramador and um, they followed her and eventually got her when they had um, those things in uh, in her vehicle that's uh, that's the white unmarked white um, is, is um, that a woman yeah that's um, okay. yeah that's a belly faith okay so they, they were able to track and now took her to the warehouse where she actually went earlier to load those things and then eventually were able to recover over, two, I mean, that's 2,750,000 pieces of tramadol. Tramadol of 225 and 250 milligrams, not 50, not the, not the medically permitted it ones, illicit ones. Mm. 225 milligrams. Tramadol is not what you can even take uh, 50 milligrams on you. I mean, I've been, I've spoken to one of your colleagues there before who said, um, who said uh, there was a time her medical doctor, I mean, her doctor prescribed and um, gave her 50 mg, and for days she couldn't get herself, she couldn't feel her body. That's mm -hmm. the impact of it. Now imagine 225 and 250. So we're able to get that then. We also, we had to also, the team also had to go for the other two transnational. Actually, that one cuts across borders. Mm -hmm. And um, also, again, 
something, um, the, in fact, the first one that was arrested um, in Lekki, they were actually about distributing cocaine and Canadian loud when our men also, we, you know, we have a way of tracking them okay. anyway. So we're able to get them <laughs> and uh, just at the niche of time. Okay, thank yeah. you so much for that information. But we're going to pause here now uh, for a break and uh, listen to a, a cross-section of Nigerians on the issue of um, uh, drug, uh, illicit trafficking as put together by a correspondent, Patricia Esami Luba. Don't go away. Parenthood is one major challenge we had at the moment. You could check there, most parents here, they leave, they leave the upbringing of their children to nannies, to teachers, trying to look for greener pasture. The husband, they, they, they can't even, they don't even know who they gave birth to. You understand? Then the other factor there I can really say is that we need to reject our system of education. I think we are practicing some stuff that they are not really, they, 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 we, are, we are practicing what for 60 years back, these countries that we, that, that we, that we got some of this stuff from, they did no longer use them. One is from the angle of the leadership, and one is from the angle of society. On the side of the society, I am sorry to say, a lot of people are not doing well. And if you want to deal with the issue of drug abuse, you must ensure that you know the kind of friends your children keep. A little beyond that, there's issue of poverty and there's issue of unemployment. The drug barons are very smart, even though we try as much as possible to be smarter than them. They look at the vulnerable, they look at the advantage they can get. If you look at the series of uh, arrests over time, it's either these people are paid this or they are paid that for them to be able to traffic on drug, and this is quite challenging. And it's something that's supposed to be eradicated eh, by self-discipline and government intervention. Uh, you know, illiteracy, lack of education is involved. Lack of job is involved. When somebody is frustrated, he will like to go on drugs so that I don't really know, you understand, but it's something that, that needs to be eradicated. Uh, this is still Nigeria today. We're looking at the issue of um, uh, so, uh, containing drug trafficking and abuse in Nigeria. Um, uh, Chooks, you had all he, he said there, and um, we'll just go straight to what are the possible solutions, you know, to these uh, menace we have in our hands. As much as um, uh, uh, it would rather be surprising that youths are involved in the acts of illicit trafficking. But more alarming, recent data, we see uh, uh, elders, so to speak, mm -hmm. from 55 to 60. Why the increase? Why this uh, increase in involvement? Well, there is pressure. I think there is pressure everywhere. There is, there is pressure everywhere. But, that, but that it's pressure everywhere isn't uh, enough excuse for people to elect to destroy themselves. And that's what I would uh, say. Well, I think on the one hand, I think that um, the government should um, be alive to its responsibilities. When I say the government, of course, I mean the federal, the state, and the local government. Uh, the people are crying at the moment. We are not in the best uh, uh, best of times. Uh, economically, so many people are struggling to um, survive, uh, breathe actually, and all of that. So. Uh, the authorities would have to do something about the current economic conditions. Okay, let me ask you this. What should the government or the authority do differently? Okay. In the area of employment, especially as pertains to the youth population of this country, I mean, the federal government should declare a state of emergency uh, in the area of unemployment in this country. We have growing unemployment uh, rate in this country. And what that means is that young people are, are left with uh, little or no option but to begin to flirt with vices, all of that. There is no reasonable young person that 
comes from a, a stable home that would want to be in the dungeon and start exchanging syringe with um, their peers and all of that. Some of these young people that you hear that have been hooked on these hard drugs, some of them are well educated. Some of them have their postgraduate, some of them are master's degree holders, some of them are actually uh, uh, PhD holders. But because there is no employment, when they feel the place, uh, given their age and all of that, they are unable to manage that particular phase of their lives. Well, we still have some who do manage that particular phase of their life, but I think that the government, the community, the society at large, owe it a duty to support these young people so that they can navigate through that particular sensitive period of your phase of their lives. So government should be proactive in the areas. Government should think outside of the box to say how technical education can be strengthened in our country as opposed to what we have at the moment so that as universities, polytechnics and colleges of education are turning out graduates, they are able to start something on their own without relying on white collar jobs and all of that. That will help a whole lot in at least containing and curtailing youth involvement in drug abuse. Okay. Apart from that, sorry, apart from that too, I, I, I also think that the community should, on their own, take it as a responsibility to educate their own okay. in, with a view to complementing the commendable effort of NDLA in that regard. Because what the young people or the women or the older people do as regards indulging in drug abuse and illicit trafficking worsens their situation. It does not in any way help at all. Thank you so much. Uh, Fabi, I, I know uh, as much as I know NDLA has been doing a lot, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, curbing the menace in, in our country. However, we still have increase in these drug abuse and uh, illicit trafficking of drugs. Now, I know you've, uh, uh, in, you've uh, had some collaborations with, uh, you know, the U.S. and of course you signed a memorandum with the customs and all of that. Are there more collaborations that uh, you think you need uh, to, you know, do more in, in trying to curb the menace. Well, thank you. Um, you already know we, we do not just um, collaborate with um, local stakeholders, that's whether at the national or sub-national levels, but then internationally we have to um, strengthen our partnerships with our counterparts out there, whether in the UK, in the US, in India, in South Africa, everywhere all over the world because it is a global scourge. So not one nation can do it all alone. You need to work hand in hand with others. Now, having said that, I would say that um, if there is any partnership or collaboration we need more than any other, apart from our uh, other law enforcement agencies or MDAs, that is ministry departments and agencies of government that we work with, whether you talk of NAMDA, Federal Ministry of Health, Health, Federal Ministry of Education, Women Affairs, and all of these um, government institutions, we need the people. And that was the whole essence of um, the agency initiating or setting up or launching War Against Drug Abuse, WADA Advocacy Initiative in, on June 26, 2021, which was primarily set up to mobilize everybody, every citizens to buy in and take ownership of the war against. I'm happy that um, uh, my colleague we have in the studio, Shuk Se, has been a part of that process. He's, he has a Sirani, a platform which he also uses to educate and mobilize the young people to discourage them from going into substance abuse. So we need the partnership with the people, and that's why, because this whole thing has to be about, I mean, it has to be a collective effort. It's not just about one government agency, or it's not about President Tinubu, it's not about NDLA or so General Mara, it's about all of us. Okay, collect quickly before you go, tell us what, what should be the role of the uh, community leaders, uh, you know, uh, the people. Oh, uh, the, awesome. Into, yeah. At the community level, now that's why our, our commands all across the country have been going to those communities to meet with these community leaders, to engage with them, to educate them, and also 
get them to pass down the information, the same knowledge, the same facts here with them to the I mean to other people in those communities. The whole essence of that is one because when you look at those um, abusing illicit substances, they live in the same community. When you look at those um, trafficking, they live in communities. So indeed, communities have roles, especially the community leaders. And whether, the people know them. Of course, people, people know they know them. People. That's why we say, look, I, I, I used to, we, at the NDLA, we cite this instance um, that some months ago where there was an outbreak of um methamphetamine in the southeast. You see the way the people, the community leaders, rose up and resisted. You know, they told this, they worked hand in hand with NDLA at that point and told these people, look, you cannot do this in these communities. That is actually the people taking the battle in their hands and resisting uh, the, 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 these people. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Femi, there. Uh, uh, that's where we will draw the curtain for today. But before we do that, we must appreciate our guests. Uh, thanks for, uh, uh, for their insight. Femi Baba, Femi, Director of Media and Advocacy, National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate having me. And also Chuks Akamadu, a legal practitioner, and also the President, Center for Ethical Rebirth among Nigerians. Nigerian youth, Serrani. Thank you for coming and you're sharing your thoughts with us. <laughs> My pleasure. And also to our viewer, thank you so much for always being a part of the Don't Forget. The program Nigeria Today airs weekday at 7.30 uh, p.m. on NTA News 24. You can watch this and other episodes on www.youtube.com slash NTA News 24. Once again, thank you for being there. I am your carrier, Clinton. Bye.